Hi, Terry. Thanks for joining us on the Next Gen Info channel. Uh, good to have you. Hey, Jim. It's great to be here. Good to see you again. So I understand that AR Labs has been pushing ahead on its mission to, I guess, uncork the, the bottlenecks in uh, data center interconnects, and it's been a busy season. Why don't you tell us first about the stuff that you guys were showing at the recent supercomputing show in Atlanta? Yeah, so Jim, we we just this is the week of Supercomputing 24, and we just came just came out of the show. It was really a good show for us. We 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 showed some things that we had shown earlier this year, and some good partnerships we have with people like Corning and and the Intel Altera Group. But we also showed some new things this year at the booth just for SC24. We brought out a piece of work we've been doing with Fujitsu, and basically showing the vision of Fujitsu's architecture using optical I.O. from our labs and, and really just laying the foundation of how we could do that together with them going forward. So that was a big piece of what we brought out at this, this show. And then another thing that we developed a bit earlier this year and, and really brought out at this show was we have a, an AI simulator, which shows the benefit to both profitability as well as interactivity of AI models when they deploy optical I.O. in those models. And so that that had a number of variables that could be adjusted based on who was your interest in the model. And we were showing that live at the event as well. So those were two of a number of things that we brought out uh, new for this SC24 event. Okay, great. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit about the building blocks that you have here? So you start with your optical I.O. chiplet, right? And yeah. now you're building it out in partnership with others. So how do, how do these pieces fit together? Yeah, that's, that's uh, you know, the basis of the solution that our labs provides is made up of two base product lines. There's a Terrify optical IO chiplet, which is then paired with our supernova light source. And so those two components we've been showing uh, and showed at this uh, supercomputing event Running live, we've been building these ships and these lasers, um, and we continue to do that in our roadmap in the coming years. But one of the things that we kind of focused on for this event was, you know, we've shown our silicon works. We've shown we can build, you know, thousands of these things. But to go to high volume manufacturing, that's another level of effort inside of the ecosystem and the supply line. One of the things that gets a lot of attention and we're spending a lot of time on in the next year is how do you do the fiber attach into the chiplet in such a way that can be done in a high volume manufacturing kind of beat rate and can also enable the packaging and test activities that need to happen when you build a multi-chip package. And what we're doing there with a couple of, of partners is including uh, Intel Foundry Services is a detachable connector. Um, so that allows you to attach fiber to the chiplet. And then when you when you are doing uh, package and test or other things where it's not beneficial to have the fiber attached, you can detach it and then retouch it later. So that's a big thing that we're enabling and working with partners on as we go through the coming year. Yeah, absolutely. The packaging uh, aspect of it, it looks like it's it, it's key, right, for, for reaching that kind of manufacturability. So could you perhaps... Uh, Tell us a little bit more about that optical interconnect, the, the connecting in those fibers. How, how is it done? How do you get the alignments right? How do you make sure that it stays in place so it doesn't shift or move? Yeah, that, well, there's a there's differently different approaches to the effort uh, depending on kind of how you're how you what you're wanting to to accomplish. But one of the things about the piece we're doing with Intel Foundry Services is the V grooves that are in our uh, Terrify chiplet that, that we make with, with our partners at Global Foundries, this detachable device uses those V-grooves just as they are, just as they have been. So as we've made a fixed fiber uh, attached to that chiplet in, in the prior years, and we've shown that in our uh, examples, it's really just about not having the fixed fiber in the chip using the same V-grooves. And working with Intel Foundry, they found a way to uh, incorporate a detachable uh, mechanical mechanism using those V-grooves in the chip. So what's really great about it is it's repeatable in that you can detach, attach and detach it, and it also just uses the chip as it's made today. Um, so that that gives us kind of a, a foot up on the foundation of how you do it at high volume. You continue to make the chips we've been making uh, in the V-grooves and the way we've been making them, and then we can use this uh, attachable, detachable connector with them. 
All right, great. I also wanted to ask you about the work with Fujitsu. And I, I guess that's part of the story of going from from the lab to production. Yeah. So w- w- what was going on with Fujitsu? Well, you know, one of the great things about getting to work with partners like Fujitsu is there's, you know, we've been working with them for quite some time now. So, but there comes a stage in that maturity where, where we both decide, hey, this is something we should talk more publicly about. And, and thankfully, you know, supercomputing 24 is where we could do that. With Fujitsu, if you take the, the, the big project they were known for uh, around supercomputing, which was the Fugaku machine, you know, that was a both processor and machine, the entire ecosystem uh, built out from the designs of Fujitsu directly. Um, so we are then partnering with them on how they may think about the next uh, big supercomputing design and what they do with that. So for us, it's it's really helpful to have the knowledge that they have from a system architecture standpoint and how you deploy something like optical in the system. And I think, you know, one of the things we bring from our side is the the value we can deliver with our optical interconnects within their system architecture. So it's, a you know, I'm excited about what we're doing with them that we showed at the event. And I'm also excited about what we've got planned with them to do for the for the coming years. All right, great. And lastly, I'd like to go back to one of the, the things you mentioned right at the beginning, which is the modeling or the simulation. It often seems that people are designing the next data center while in flight. Um, you know, things are moving so fast. So how could this tool be used? I think the the tool that we have and that we represented at the show this past week was it's really um, anchored around this idea that you can have, if you think about an XY curve, you can have the interactivity, let's say, across maybe the, the X axis of the curve, so along the horizontal. Interactivity represents, you know, users like you and I. And when you're engaging with a with an AI model, uh, how quickly are you getting to that first bit of information that's coming to you and then the subsequent bits of information that's coming to you from the model? So if you want to think about that as represented by tokens, how many tokens you're getting per second over time? And then the y-axis being the profitability of the people who are running those AI machines. So that includes things like the cost of energy and the cost of uh, the components to build the machines. And what our model really is used to show is that uh, electrical Traditional state-of-the-art electrical interconnects have a role to play there, but they do get limited when you start trying to stretch out over time the tokens generated over time and also the profitability of those machines. So what our model shows is that uh, optical I.O. really just opens another level of what can be done with AI in the future. Mm -hmm. And to do one of those things, one of the things that really jumped out to to me and I think uh, impressed a number of people that we showed it to, when you get into token per second production, There comes a point where humans, you and I, cannot necessarily perceive or take in all the the information that's being produced. And that tends to be at around 50 tokens per second. So around that point, the model is generating more information than you or I maybe could consume at that rate. But above that point, and you can get way above that point with optical I.O., you really enable next level ability of agentic behavior within AI models. So you get the machines talking to machines at a much faster pace and level that then helps to generate uh, answers that they then relay to the user. So that part is really exciting. You get a much longer runway of that with optical IO than you can with copper. So um, yeah, faster, 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 always better, right? But that profitability, I, I take it also comes back to the power savings of optical over electrical? That is, that is certainly one of the components. Um, and how you, if you can think about the interactivity increasing, the way you can monetize the same hardware across multiple users that are using it, if you're hosting uh, AI, uh, an AI data center, that also leads to the profitability. So how, how much utilization are you getting out of the expense that you spent on the capital equipment, as well as what you're spending for energy to run that equipment? So both of those factors feed into, uh, in a big way, into the profitability that you get. All right. Great. Building the business case. Well, thanks for sharing this update today and, uh, you know, look forward to seeing you guys at OFC, which will be here sooner than uh, just around the corner. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Terry. 